bem-vindos à nossa live com o professor Michael Rogan. Professor Michael Rogan é Chief Compliance Officer da Charles Schwab Investment Management. Ele tem doutorado pela Suffolk University, mestrado pela Lindell University e bacharelado pelo Bates College. Além disso, ele possui uma licença finca série 7. Tem mais de 35 anos de experiência na indústria financeira, na área de compliance, gestão de risco, bancária e jurídica. E, basicamente, a Charles Schwab Investment é um dos principais, um dos principais fundos de investimento com trilhões de dólares sob sua gestão. E ele é o Chief Compliance Officer dessa empresa. É um prazer tê-lo aqui. Eu vou passar agora para o inglês, mas feita essa apresentação, também agradeço a participação de vocês que estão vindo, a presença do, do Alfredo, nosso diretor, e dos meus orientados da Amanda. Michael, I did a little introduction about you in Portuguese for all our visitors, and today our topic is Tone the Talk, the partnership between executives and compliance staff. Michael, it's a pleasure to have you here with us, and you have all the space to make our presentation. Great. Well, thank you very much, Professor Dalton. And um, I'm going to <clears throat> call up my slides here. All right. Uh, so um, thank you for that introduction. Uh, as you noted, uh, the topic uh, today is tone at the top. Now, uh, just by way of brief introduction, um, I hope you've heard this concept before. Um, it's often cited as the foundation on which an effective compliance program is built. Um, implicit in that observation, though, is the reality that compliance could design a program that meets best practices, but that may not be effective. And it won't be effective if executive leadership does not visibly and vocally support its importance. What I hope to accomplish today um, is uh, to explore the relationship uh, in certain aspects between executive leadership and compliance staff to understand how a weak or a limited relationship can represent a point of vulnerability in compliance programs. And by a point of vulnerability, I mean a point that can actually lead to compliance failures. So this is very much a question of, um, in many ways, relationships. Um, so uh, here's what I uh, what I propose to do. We'll start by setting the stage, uh, and I want to give three examples of compliance problems. <clears throat> One of which we talked about last time, uh, and the other two are probably familiar to you. Um, they will give us, you know, kind of a, the the stage, real life examples where specific problems came about uh, and therefore um, a framework to talk about what are good practices to ensure communication. I'll then go into um, what I would observe um, you know, by way of practice as good practices. How do we ensure that there is communication between executives and compliance staff? And then at the end, you know, I'll leave time for discussion if you'd like um, and really asking, is this enough um, is there something more, you know, maybe that I haven't covered um, uh, in order to, you know, really give a very practical lens to what we're talking about here? All right, so let's set the stage first. Uh, so Enron um, is a well-known compliance failure, uh, and it's the failure that um, many would attribute, you know, as uh, or would, would identify as the beginning of the modern compliance era. So I've listed here some um, extracts. This, uh, these particular ones are from Investopedia. And I'll read highlights here. So um, Enron changed um, transitioned from accounting um, using a traditional historical cost accounting method to mark to market method, for which the company received official US Securities and Exchange Commission approval. So interestingly, they made a change. They received approval from the regulator. Now, um, mark to market is a measure of fair value of accounts that can change over time. Uh, and it aims, aims to provide a realistic appraisal of the, um, uh, of the company's current financial situation. And it's, it's a very commonly used practice, but it can be manipulated. 
It's not based on actual cost, but on fair value. So, you know, it's much harder to pin down. Um, people must be involved in setting what that number is. And you could see that, you know, by, by nature, because it is not something that is uh, pulled from a third party that's available and widely distributed, it can be manipulated, including by executives. So that's the background. Mark to market um, is one of the uh, important factors in Enron's uh, falling apart. Um, they were using off balance sheet uh, companies in order to move some of their transactions off balance sheet uh, and therefore, you know, effectively hidden uh, from the public. One of their vice presidents, though, uh, a woman named Sharon Watkins, wrote a letter to Lay, the CEO, in August of 2001, warning that the company could implode in a wave of, uh, of accounting scandals. A few months later, Enron collapsed. So her role as a whistleblower in exposing Enron's corporate misconduct uh, was widely recognized uh, and led to her being, you know, one of the three times persons of the year, you know, I guess a very important thing in, uh, to some people in the United States, um, but there've been a lot of notoriously um, uh, less uh, um, um, uh, ethical people who have had that honor. So um, be that as it is, this is an example of a person in that leadership who actually took steps uh, to alert um, in case the CEO wasn't aware of it, that you know, there was some funny accounting going on. Uh, yes. No, oh, I'm sorry. Just a problem, Michael. You can. Oh, okay. Continue. Okay. I thought there may have been a question. That's fine. All right. So um, that's one example. Second example: the Bernie Madoff case. Now, Bernie Madoff um, was alleged to have um, built investors of fifty billion dollars through a scheme that. Um, basically is considered um, a modern day Ponzi scheme. He was taking money from customers, um, inflating using fake statements, the values of their account. When somebody took money out, he paid money out um, and he would bring more money in to pay that money out. So it was a constant um, churning of money. Um, Let's see. So he had about 4,800 investment accounts as of November 30th, 2008, uh, issued statements for that month reporting client accounts with balances of about $65 billion, but he actually only held a small fraction of that balance for clients. So clearly, um, he was trying to perpetrate you know, a very, very significant financial fraud here. Interestingly, as the second bullet point notes, several of his family members worked for him. His younger brother, Peter, was saint, uh, senior managing director and chief compliance officer, very important for our discussion. And uh, Peter's daughter, uh, Shanna Madoff, was the compliance attorney. Madoff's sons, Mark and Andrew, worked in the trading section along with his nephew, Charles Weiner. So this is an interesting set of facts where it's not uh, a um, an unrelated person, but it's a whole group of related people. Another variable. Now, you know, did that mean they were working in collusion? Um, that has not been uh, affirmatively proved. But on June 12th, as this third bullet point uh, no, um, um, uh, identifies, Brother Peter uh, was uh, expected to appear in court uh, to admit to falsifying records, making false statements uh, to securities regulators and obstructing the work of the IRS service. And he was sentenced to prison for his role. So another example of bad behavior, uh, clearly initiating at the top, uh, which um, may have been able to be detected, uh, but you know, it apparently wasn't either detected or if it was known, it was not reported by uh, the family members who occupied senior positions here. The third example I've chosen here is the uh, example of the uh, Société Générale uh, trading um, uh, uh, loss from 2008 also. 
So in 2008, uh, Société Générale lost about 4.9 billion euro, closing out positions um, uh, that uh, were undertaken by one of its employees, Jérôme Carvier, who was a trader. Now, Jérôme was not a senior person in the company by any measure. Uh, he actually, according to the police, um, may not have even been involved with fraud. Uh, they did not find evidence to charge him with fraud. Um, uh, so, you know, they uh, charged him instead with breach of trust and illegally accessing computers. Um, he claims that his actions were known to his supervisors and that the bosses, uh, I'm sorry, the losses were caused by panic selling by the bank. Um, very interesting uh, set, set of facts here and different from the other two, where this does not involve a senior person, you know, with responsibility directly for the actions that caused the loss. Although, you know, based on these facts, uh, as stated here, it is entirely possible that those senior persons were aware of what was going on. At the end of this next bullet, you see that um, it's, you know, it was identified that um, he had made the bank a profit of $2 billion the prior year. So, you know, again, it's conceivable that this was activity that may not have been um, entirely sanctioned by procedures, but it was allowed possibly because the bank profited um, in the past. Now that things fell apart, um, uh, you know, there's, um, uh, there's a different approach. Now, another factor here that differentiates it from the previous two, Calviel himself is not thought to have profited personally. Of these massive losses that he made, um, one report I read said that the year uh, before, I think he may have received a bonus of 300,000 euro. So very, very, very small compared to you know, the alleged losses. Um, now I'm going to give my disclaimer. I pulled these from Wikipedia, so you know the facts may be somewhat different if you go to a different source. Uh, I don't know. I didn't pull you know directly from the actual fraud charges here, but um, the broader point is that you know we have three very different circumstances that involve ultimately what most people would think should have been. Um, uh, covered by compliance programs, right? It involves non-ethical behavior, therefore should be prohibited by compliance programs, but also should have been detected by those same programs at some point. So going back to the topic, what about tone at the top? Um, we have, again, three examples here um, where various people at different levels were involved. And um, you know, the question becomes, what is this partnership between executives and compliance staff? Well, clearly in the Enron situation, the fact that the, there was a, a, a blood relationship between the CEO and the compliance staff is not a very good uh, factor. That's something you know, clearly that should be avoided. Um, the fact that a senior executive was willing to raise her hand to say, I think things are, are not being done uh, appropriately here is also a very you know positive factor there, but unfortunately it was too late and she raised her hand at a, you know just before the company was failing, uh, so nothing could be done to prevent the failure there. In the Madoff case, um, regulators had you know approved the activity uh, in question. The um, again the fact that um, these were relatives. Um, and if I mixed up the prior one, um, it's the Madoff case where the brother uh, is the chief compliance officer. That is not a good situation. Um, in the Enron case, we don't, uh, I don't believe there was actually a, you know, a chief compliance officer. And that does raise the question about compliance's role with regard to accounting. Should compliance play a role overseeing accounting? I'm not going to address that here. Uh, again, it's more for the example uh, that the facts give us on how to evaluate uh, compliance programs. All right, so um, what does tone at the top mean? How is it implemented? Um, I'm gonna, um, uh, before I dive into uh, the slide, the three lines of defense model, I wanna give a little example from my own career. When I started my position at Charles Schwab, I entered a company that had been you know, in business for quite some time. 
uh, and had a particular way of operating. Um, without sounding too much like a sociologist, uh, you know, I do remember thinking I'm entering um, a community, right? This is a community of workers. Uh, they're like any community. We have, you know, our local mayor and, and aldermen who run the city. Well, here we have a CEO, a CFO. They're the heads. They're responsible for what goes on. But I was a member of, a, became a member of a community that had existing practices. My challenge was to become accepted in that community, if you will. Uh, and I raise that because I think one of the most important things um, compliance uh, personnel can do is develop relationships, become part of the community, but don't lose sight of your independence as you are becoming part of the community. Um, and I, I mentioned that because you know you could look at the three examples uh, I highlighted at the outset, and you know at least in the Madoff example, it seemed like there was a lack of independence given the filial relationship uh, between the CEO and the CCO. So relationship becomes extremely important. And structure, you know, it, we have, as I mentioned in the city, we've got a structured relationship with who runs the city and the, the citizens, we can vote, but you know, they're actually making decisions. Well, you know, a similar type of structure has been implemented um, and, and endorsed by regulators uh, around the world, uh, which were the one we call the three lines of defense model. Now, it was articulated in a position paper published in 2008 to 10 by the Federation of European Risk Management Associations and the European Confederation of Institutes on Internal Accounting. It may have been in existence before then. I certainly remember hearing about this throughout my career. But, you know, I think importantly, uh, this was a publication of acceptance, uh, which came about uh, around the time of the financial crisis uh, and the Madoff example and the Société Générale example. So it's reiterating the importance of structure here. The reason they cite uh, to support the model uh, is that it's intended to enhance the understanding of governance, risk management, and um, control by clarifying roles and duties. This fits very neatly into this notion of a relationship, right, where um, each of us, you know, in any um, social setting have roles and responsibilities. Um, we want to work collectively together, but sometimes those roles, uh, the roles we're assigned may require that we play more active roles, take certain decisions, etc. And so the structure behind this, these three groups of internal stakeholders that we call the three lines of, of defense, really try to identify three categories there of these, these groups. So the first group, the first line, is the business level of management and internal controls. I think um, thinking, well, certainly in, in my company, we think of first line as the business, the very first place where ideas um, about the business are uh, incubated, where they are implemented, uh, and where the first level decisions about how we structure them and how we deliver whatever it is we're delivering by way of product or service to the client, all made in that first line. And the first line implicitly will want to ensure that there are some controls. You know, you can take um, a basic example of, uh, you know, a car manufacturer. Well, you absolutely want to be sure uh, you're building a product that, you know, will, will, drive off the lot when the client uh, purchases it. You do, don't want it to fall apart. So you have quality control um, uh, at that first line. Well, the notion here is that they should not just be thinking about those um, business and you know, direct client uh, related controls and quality controls in terms of product, but they should also be thinking of compliance related controls that um, that are appropriate for the business and for the, um, the model. The second line now gets one step away, and this is where we have uh, some independence, right? So independent risk oversight, which would include risk management, financial controls, and compliance. So going to the question I raised earlier about accounting, well, you know, you want to ensure that 
there are some financial controls that are overseen by people who have um, um, the knowledge of the technical knowledge uh, about accounting, but also have the independence so that they can uh, you know, give an independent perspective on what's being done in the first line. So now we've got the second group, right, that is um, charged with a slightly different responsibility here. Um, they are bringing a different perspective um, and hopefully grounding the first line in important elements of control from a risk standpoint, whether it's with regard to finance, regulatory compliance, human resource compliance, et cetera. And then the third line uh, is internal audit. So internal audit, um, again, is one step removed from uh, the second line. They are not reporting into the second line. They are entirely independent and they actually will conduct reviews of the second line. So they're looking at whether the first line is doing what it should do and also opining on whether the second line is doing what it should do up to and including providing that independent risk oversight. So another way of looking at this, as I've noted here in the first bullet, is uh, this notion of risk ownership, right? So the first line owns the risk. The second line is responsible for risk control and the third line for risk assurance. And I really, the uh, objective is to prevent um, the development of coverage gaps um, and ensure a greater likelihood of effective risk management ulti ultimately. We're not relying on any single line. We're not saying compliance is owned only by compliance, but it's owned by the first line as well. And it might appear to suggest a distancing of the lines, meaning that compliance should not interact frequently with the business. Um, I actually don't um, look at uh, this to, to mean that at all. If implemented effectively, in my view, it means that compliance maintains its independence, but not necessarily its distance. In fact, to achieve its objectives, it has to understand the business. I tell my team all the time, uh, we need to understand the business better than the business does. Why? In order to oversee it, right? We are responsible for risk control, but we need to understand what it is we are seeking to, you know, quote unquote, control, or which risks we are seeking to mitigate. We have to understand the business. But it also recalls that, um, uh, that concept that I um, started with earlier, that notion of a relationship. We have to have a strong, I have to have a strong relationship with the business in order for them not to exclude me, in order for them to feel comfortable sharing information with me. Um, but you know, I also have to be careful not to cross the line so that I become um, less able to bring an independent compliance perspective. Now, focusing again on relationship, you know, <laughs> we all have relationships and our relationships sometimes uh, require delivering uh, a difficult message, right? Um, a well-functioning family uh, will be able to handle that. It's not always easy, but you know, families get through it. Well, that is similar in the corporate context, you know, by way of this expectation that we call effective challenge. Uh, and this notion is one that, at least in the U.S. and I believe um, on a global basis, is adopted by. Uh, the financial regulators we consider prudential regulators, those that are um, looking to ensure that the business is prudently run. So not necessarily giving rules and regulations, but saying you need to do this in a way that is sustainable, achieving certain objectives, et cetera. So they've adopted this model in particular. Uh, and um, the third line, the three lines of defense model uh, offers a structure uh, in which the notion of effective challenge can thrive. And really, it can occur at all levels. When you think of you know, development of a new business product, 
uh, you would, I would hope that the business people as they're brainstorming about a product will feel comfortable enough to challenge it, right? If somebody thinks that uh, developing a product, for example, um, a vehicle and adding a feature that actually would, uh, would create, um, you know, uh, a risk, uh, maybe an, a risk of injury to somebody. Somebody would say that's no, nah, probably not a good idea, right? That's not what we want. Well, likewise, uh, when you know you're dealing with a regulated industry, pharmaceutical industry, uh, the financial industry, you'd hope that in that first instance, uh, the first line would be um, uh, providing this level of challenge. But if this is working well, there should be opportunity for the second and the third line. In, uh, to uh, provide that challenge as well. So um, frequently the, the governance structures of an organization, again, you know, going back to the, the, the analogy I drew with the community, you know, the, the board of the um, um, mayor of the town has town um, meetings and, you know, people are able to attend, you know, there's a, an agenda. Uh, topics are discussed, uh, and people can raise um, concerns. They can raise objections. Well, we need to be sure in the corporate context that we have that same sort of structure. We need to have committees where um, the opportunity to raise effective challenge uh, exists. And they may not just be committees. They could be meetings. You know, they could be uh, in a smaller organization. Uh, informal opportunities uh, to solicit input from others and to get, you know, very um, meaningful feedback, you know, by way of this effective challenge. And I go back to, you know, the notion I described earlier, uh, we have to understand the business, you know, at least as well as if not better than the business in order to be able to challenge effectively. And effective challenge, you know, is going to require some distance uh, I'm sorry, some independence from the business, but independence to me is more, you know, that mental state where we keep ourselves um, um, more dedicated to ethical principles than to the relationship principles with the person. Um, but, you know, we have to be able to uh, bring that uh, independence while having a strong enough relationship that we are um, working with the business and knowledgeable about what's going on. So, you know, what's required for effective challenge? Well, um, you know, I think engaging with the business, uh, going back to that relationship concept is extremely important. Uh, and that means being present as important topics are discussed new product development, dealing with issues on existing products, uh, client complaints, a very important source, as it turns out, for um, potential problems. If we see that there are, um, there's an increase, if we monitor complaints and we see that there's an increase in a particular type of client complaint, that could be a leading indicator that there's a problem that should be looked at. Uh, looking at production issues, you know, and this applies, I think, you know, to any industry. If it's a, a vehicle manufacturing uh, company, if it's a um, pharmaceutical company making pharmaceuticals, or if it's a financial company making a financial product, if there's a production issue, um, you know, that could uh, lead to certain decisions being made that, you know, may not always um, uh, that have to be considered from, you know, the broader um, risk management lens. Uh, and that um, creates this opportunity for effective challenge. And then importantly, claims made in marketing and promotional activities. You know, that uh, I think in many examples uh, is where uh, problems arise. The claims, you know, um, on, you know, the effective of the product or the, um, uh, the impact the product can have don't always match what you know, is, is understood to be behind the scenes. And if a company starts creating those sorts of marketing and promotional um, uh, materials, um, which are misleading, uh, the company will likely have a problem. <clears throat> Thank you.
All right, so um, we're close to discussion. Maybe just a few closing comments. Tone at the top really requires this partnership between executives and compliance um, staff. And I've mentioned a couple of ways in which that relationship can play out. Um, most importantly is the, the interpersonal relationship. It is extremely important for um, the person in the compliance role to be able to um, have a discussion with executives. If I go back to the Enron situation where you know, the person um, felt comfortable enough to write a letter to the CEO. Um, you know, that takes a lot of guts. Um, you know, it takes a lot of um, risk. Uh, in her particular instance, I think she was, at the time she wrote the letter, she was considered an executive on the executive floor. And after um, the letter, uh, she was moved out of the executive floor and basically, you know, kept kept on as an employee, but she was stripped of her uh, important duties. Um, so, you know, there's there's a certain element of risk uh, in terms of job security that you know the compliance officer uh, needs to be able to address. But you know, that's where that partnership has to be strong. Ideally, you want to be able to develop a relationship where the business people, the executives, and the more senior people understand and, and trust you enough that when you say something may be bad, uh, they believe it. Um, and you know, that means a balance. Every issue doesn't rise to the level of um, uh, something that needs to go to the CEO, for example. Um, so there's got to be you know, a balancing um, of importance and of significance of issues. But there needs to be, uh, and, and so that means, you know, certain issues probably can be resolved, um, you know, at a lower level. But if, if they're not being resolved at a lower level, or when they rise to a certain uh, level of importance or significance uh, to the company, that's when, you know, these strong relationships uh, can, be, uh, can be utilized to have those important discussions. Um, you know, within the compliance department itself, you know, it's always a challenge, I think, uh, for junior people, you know, to who maybe don't have the broader perspective. Uh, so, you know, cultivating within a compliance department um, a, an environment of growth, <clears throat> um, creating opportunities for them to see some of the more challenging um, um, topics that are dealt with and how to deal with them effectively. Um, and that only prepares them, you know, for um, what they may need to do in the future. Uh, um, and then another comment, um, how is this tone at the top? How can it be communicated? Much of the communication, and I think I mentioned earlier, it should be communicated visually and verbally. Um, visually, you know, I think um, can be, as simple as, uh, and by visual, I don't necessarily, I mean optically, right? Um, how does something appear to, to the, to the um, staff at large? If the compliance officer or compliance professionals are kept off you know, on a separate floor, they don't have participation on committees, um, they are not seen as you know, strategic partners uh, to the executives, then um, you know, I would say that that's an example of lack of tone at the top, um, or at least it could be understood as lack of tone at the top. So you know, there's that component. There is the messaging also. Um, a senior executive you know, who is willing to send a message to all employees reminding them of uh, compliance obligations, or probably more importantly and more broadly, reminding them of the importance of ethical behavior and ethical um, activity. I think that's essential um, to establishing this tone at the top. Um, you know, other ways uh, that that can be accomplished would include, you know, having a compliance committee that has jurisdiction and authority. Um, 
you know, I've seen it operate where it's not necessarily a separate compliance committee. It could be, for example, a risk committee. Um, but, you know, having a committee dedicated in some way to risk that includes compliance risk sends a very strong message uh, to employees about um, the importance of compliance uh, in that organization. And then uh, another really important um, element is enforcement. And I know that raises you know, all sorts of challenges where people think, oh, if compliance is viewed as you know, just the cops, the enforcers, that that may not be effective ultimately. They would not be able to maintain strong relationships if that's the case. Um, while I agree with that generally, <clears throat> I think there needs to be balance. We need to do enough by what I've talked about, establishing relationships so that as we do surveillance activities, they are not necessarily viewed um, as you know, being cops or um, people understand that we bring more value than just looking for errors. But when we do find errors, um, I think it's important here for the relationships um, to be brought to play. So if there is, you know, a, a violation of a particular rule and it's done frequently um, by the same person, that may mean uh, or may warrant going to that person's, you know, supervisor or, you know, the senior executive in that division uh, to deliver a message to them. If we're not as an organization willing to do that, um, it will be very hard, you know, to um, support the conclusion that there's a strong tone at the top. If, the, if we're not willing to hold people accountable, um, tone at the top is not going to be, um, you know, certainly from my standpoint, um, effectively executed. So I will pause there um, and ask if anybody has any specific questions on what I've said or comments, or if, you know, if you'd like to. Um, comment on or even correct anything I've said. Okay, Michael, thank you. was, uh, again, an excellent presentation, very elucidative. Uh, I will ask if he, our audience has any questions for you or I will make some questions. Pessoal, se tem alguma questão para o Michael, alguém quer fazer uma pergunta diretamente para ele? Lídia, tem alguma pergunta no YouTube para ele diretamente? Não temos nenhuma pergunta no YouTube, professor. Ok. Bom, então vocês também estão tímidos, não querem professor. perguntar? Professor. Oh, pode falar, mas você pergunta professor. diretamente para ele? É que é, eu tenho uma pergunta, mas é que eu cheguei um pouco atrasado, então eu tenho medo de ele já ter explicado e, 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 e aí... É, a dúvida não ser de mais ninguém, né? Mas eu vou tentar assim mesmo, pode ser? Pode ser. Michael, Marcelo, you ask a question. Marcelo, vai lá. Good evening, professor. Uh, I have a doubt about the tone at the top. Uh, countries have different cultures. So, uh, how do you make tone at the top work when top executives have values that conflict with the values of the country where they are working? Thank you for that question, um, uh, Marcel. It's a very important uh, concept. Um, and, you know, I, we have to be flexible uh, in how we apply that concept, right? Um, now, if I understand your question correctly, the top executives have, a, have values that are different from the cultural values of the country. So are they, it, assuming they are better than the cultural values of the, com, of the country, then, um, you know, I think, uh, the compliance, uh, the, the tone at the top will be better, right? The executives can control what goes on within the company. If the, they're, so, you know, so, and that, that would be my first step. Now, there will be challenges. And I know, for 
for example, American colleges in uh, uh, doing business, for example, in um, China, where you know certain practices are acceptable in China, um, you know that we would consider bribery. So um, you know American companies uh, doing business there have to conform their conduct to call it American principles or international principles. They cannot just follow what is done in the country uh, because you know that's acceptable culturally. So I think you know ultimately tone at the top has to take into account not just one of those things, but all of them. So the values of a country or culture, the, the corporate values of the company, and certainly you know, it's important that the individual values, the ethical values of the leadership, you know, have to factor in here. But you have to construct the program around, you know, I guess what I would call, and I hope this makes sense, the least common denominator. So you don't go with the broad, the widest. If the company, country, I'm sorry, culturally allows for all of this, but you know, there's reason not to allow that in the company, then I think you should not allow it in the company, you know, and, um, you know, a good example could be where, you know, I, I don't know if this exists somewhere, but let's say the standards for developing medicine, you know, are very, 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 very loose. And um, a company wants to develop medicine, but to do it, you know, in a, in a, in a way that is less likely to have negative consequences for the, the users of the medicine. Well, then, you know, the company leadership should articulate that. Um, I will close by saying I, I appreciate your skepticism. Um, and I think, you know, it's important that we remain skeptical about that con concept, you know, because is tone at the top enough? Is effective challenge enough? Probably not. We need more. There has to be an entire ecosystem to support uh, the, you know, the overall um, effort to ensure ethical behavior. Does that answer your question? <clears throat> yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Marcelo. Anyone has another question for Michael? Michael, or all this is shy today. So I will have some questions for you, I think. Uh, Michael, how can we build a culture of commitment when our leaders' behaviors are different from what they preach? So I am, I'm thinking here, I have a leader that says something, that, that preach something, but do another thing completely different from what the core values of the company. How can we build a culture of, how can we build a culture of commitment in this scenario? That is a very tough question to answer. Um, I would answer it though by, by saying, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it by giving you my, my perspective on this. I'm an individual and I value ethical behavior. I think it's extremely important for me and it's extremely important for everybody. Now, what ethical behavior means, you know, is obviously in significant part a personal decision. But I think there are some community standards and generally, you know, accepted um, things that uh, most people would agree to. From my, I, if I found that I was working with people who don't, can you hear me? Can yes, you still yes, hear me? Hearing you. Yes. You can. Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm hearing you. So if I were working with people who, whom I felt were not practicing what they preach. So they were saying one thing and doing something else. And I was not able to influence their behavior to show them that, you know, the behavior is not supporting what they say and um, that that has implications. 
I would not be able to continue working there, you know, ultimately. So I, unfortunately, I think, you know, the draconian answer to your question, the kind of the, the far extreme answer to your question is that, you know, we all at, in a compliance role, you know, we face decisions about, you know, whether we can continue to conditions that senior executives uh, create. So probably not the best answer, but I think, unfortunately, uh, at least if you subscribe to my support for ethical behavior, then I think it's the right answer. Thank you, Michael. I have another question for you. Do you think that uh, CCO has to have a term of office or no? Has to have a term of office? Yes. What I mean with this question, I'm thinking, you said a lot about uh, impartially and communication. I'm thinking if a CCO works 25 years in the same company with the same people, maybe he will not be impartial, impartial anymore because of this time of colleagueism or friendship. So what do you think? Maybe a uh, five years, six years of duration. I don't know. I'm thinking with you right now. Yeah. I, I think it's a it's a very good question. Um, personally, I think that. Um, well, I've been in my role for 13 years, so personally, I don't. I haven't given myself a uh, a limited term. I will acknowledge, you know, that the longer I am in a role the more, the greater the possibility that I lose that independence, okay? But um, if I'm, you know, if I subscribe to ethical principles, then I will prevent that. The alternative is that by being in the role, I also have a lot of history. I know about, you know, what we have done. And I can also assure you that, you know, um, when I came into my role, it took three to four years to get The, the program to the point where I wanted it. So, you know, if I had a five year limit, then I would have been gone. Somebody else would have come in. Um, you know, does that create too much change? The next person who comes in would want to show that they're bringing value. You know, does that create too much change? I don't have an answer, um, but I will say that uh, in the accounting profession, there has been a movement to Uh, limit, you know, terms for account for um, uh, independent auditors, and you know we have seen that um, uh, I think primarily in in Europe, um, in the U.S. So in Europe, I think you have to change firms, um, I believe, or th there was a proposal. I'm not sure if that's the case. Um, in the U.S., we don't have to change firms, but the partner and the teams responsible for your company change over time. So, you know, there is, I think there's, there are certainly uh, reasons to um, um, apply that same standard uh, within the uh, compliance uh, space, but I think you'd have to look really carefully at the negative, the, the drawbacks to doing that as well. Thank you, Michael. Just for you know, here in Brazil, in the public sector, in the federal public sector, we have a six years term for oh. independence. So we now have this here. Julia has a question for you. Julia, you can make your question. Hi, Michael. Thank you, Balton. Michael, uh, I studied about the Elizabeth Holmes and the company Theranos. Uh, now we are waiting about the criminal sentence. Yeah. From your perspective, uh, what was uh, their biggest problem about the compliance, and what what uh, what could have been done? Can you talk about? Yes. So um, 
Uh, thank you for your question, Julia. Um, I, I will start by saying I don't know all of the facts because I haven't studied specifically. So I'll share what I know or what I understand to be the case. So um, first of all, it seems to me that the biggest issues they faced related to false claims of um, uh, you know, product capability. So I mentioned you know, earlier uh, the, the idea that like reviewing claims made in marketing and promotional activities. A lot of what turned out to be their problems seemed to be in that area. Now that, you know, so um, there's a term in, in, in contract law, we call it puffery. You know, oh, you, you, you just make it seem like, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're great, we're wonderful, we're big, we're, we're, we're super. Um, she was doing, it, or they were doing more than that though. So it went beyond merely saying, yes, you know, we think we have the next greatest invention to actually giving data that, you know, it turns out may not have been accurate. Um, so, you know, that's very, very misleading. Um, now it also ties into, as I understand it, the financial statements, right? So you start with claims of marketing. <clears throat> um, that has to be, you know, your, your um, financial data uh, becomes super important so that investors hear what you claim is the product and the opportunity. They see the financials, you know, and then, um, you know, failures on both parts could end up creating uh, greater problems down the road. Um, in terms of what, it, so that's what I understand, you know, were the main problems. In terms of what could potentially have <clears throat> prevented it, I would say, um, number one, I don't, even though they were involved with pharmaceuticals, I don't think they were actually producing like regulated pills. So there may have been a lack of, you know, direct regulatory guidance and, and um, requirement there. So that is one potential area. Again, I don't know all the facts. I'd have to look into it further to know definitively. But um, so, you know, that would be an outside thing. Number two, uh, I always question, you know, um, auditors, you know, I don't know what the auditors were doing. Um, I know, you know, the scope of what internal or external auditors look at, you know, has slightly increased and it tends to be all around financial statements. But in the United States, we have Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, which, you know, was a law adopted following Enron that puts lots of, you know, obligations and responsibilities around accounting records. So, you know, to be able to create accounting records that, you know, are based on potentially fraudulent um, claims and marketing seems to me to be a failure. Again, I, you know, I'd have to look at it specifically. Um, and then thirdly, I don't know for a fact whether they had, you know, any sort of whistleblower um, program. And a whistleblower program you know, would be one where an employee could call an independent person or number to say, I think something wrong is, is going on here. So I don't know if that was the case, but if it weren't, that is certainly something I think should be put in place. And, you know, I recommend any company put that in place, whether or not you have a specific compliance program. That was a publicly traded U.S. company, though. And as a publicly traded company, you know, they are subject to U.S. federal securities laws, and they should have had, a, at a minimum, a small compliance program. So, you know, if they didn't, they ought to have. And if they did, I think you'd have to look at, you know, whether or not that program was not functioning well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. And what do you know? She's guilty? Yeah. 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 Well, you know, it's a, it went to, I think it was a jury trial. So, mm -hmm. you know, people like us hearing what she was alleged to do and, you know, it sounded too good to be true. 
and it turned out not to be true. With, and with Bernie Madoff, it sounded too good to be true, and it turned out not to be true. I think there's a, there's a trend there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Anyone have any more questions here? Lydia, we have some questions on YouTube or no? Oi, professor, não temos nenhuma pergunta lá. Ok, we, we don't have any questions on YouTube, but Marcelo has another question. Marcelo, is your last question, okay, because of our time here. Ok, thank you. Uh, professor, um, in practical terms, uh, should the company's directors, the, the board of directors, receive training together with other employees, or should they be trained separately, receiving more information to later assist the education and orientation of employees in general? Thank you for that. That's a very um, uh, thoughtful question. Uh, in my view, <clears throat> the board of directors should be <clears throat> should receive different training. <clears throat> And I base that on <clears throat> the, um, the notion in the US that the directors have a very limited role. It is oversight, right? They appoint the chief executive and they're overseeing what the company does and setting strategy. What the employees are doing is much more difficult. And so, you know, I think different training is important there because the training should emphasize different things for people. Now that said, you know, the topics covered would probably be very much the same. So, you know, looking for example at whistleblower, the board of directors should understand that the company, if it has a whistleblower program, has the program and the board needs to get information about whistleblower you know, um, um, uh, complaints. So they're going to get um, a different perspective on whistleblower. The employees should learn that there is a number to call and they should be able to call and not fear retaliation as happened in the Enron case. They should not fear, um, they could make an anonymous disclosure, for example. So, you know, similar topics, but different uh, approaches to the education. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. All right. Thanks, Michael, Marcel. thank you for your time to be here with us. And was a pleasure again. And I'm looking to see you in October 